Hello, lovely internet strangers. Welcome. This is a series that I'm calling Coming to a Bookstore Near You. While I was working in publishing, I had started to compile this giant list of forthcoming books from the reports we would get from Publishers Marketplace of books related to certain topics like feminism, diversity, etc, etc, with the thought that someday when I had a YouTube channel, I might talk about them. And that day is today. Each video will be discussing different categories of books. The subject of today's video will be diverse young adult books that that are coming to a bookstore near you. The way I'll do this is I'll read the announcement as it was made in Publishers Marketplace, and then if the book exists on Goodreads or on Amazon, I'll go there and I'll look at the description and the cover, and we'll see how they're different, and I'll make my commentary. So I'll do these in order of when they're supposed to be published. The first one is Samir Ahmed's Internment, about a near future in the United States where Muslim Americans are forced into an internment camp, and a 17-year-old girl must fight against Islamophobia, oppression, and complicit silence. Yeah, I have a lot of feelings about this premise. Now, I've read a lot of young adult dystopia in my time, and young adult dystopia kind of had its moment, and that moment has largely passed. I mean, think during the time of The Hunger Games, Divergent, those are the big ones that people know because you know, they became movies and like they were big bestsellers, but there was a runoff after that of people trying to cash in. Of course, they were all trilogies, and none of the rest of them ever hit it quite as big, and after a while, people got sick of them because really almost anyone could write one. They just became so formulaic. But those dystopias were crafted in a way that made them universal. So like, for example, in The Hunger Games, there was a concept of characters being, say, darker skinned or lighter skinned, but there was nothing specific saying like African Americans, some concept that we would have, it keeps it universal. Here, this is clearly projecting, well, everything is shit for Muslim Americans right now. So let's write about a dystopia in the near future where they're forced into internment camp. How near is a near future? To me, near future usually means like no more than 40 years, maybe 50 years. Maybe I'm naive to think that we're not going to have an internment camp for Muslim Americans in the near future, but I just find it a little hard to believe. I don't think we're going to have an internment camp for any group, not even for white men, as much as a lot of feminists would probably like to make one. I'm oh, sorry, white, straight, cis, het men. Fixed it. So let's look at the description that's up there now. So this book is coming out pretty soon, March 19th, 2019. Oh, Look at this cover. It's beautiful. Look, she's got the hat. It says resist on it. I'd be interested to see if any commentary comes out about this cover where she's like kind of hiding her face because historically there's always been conversations whenever there's actually a person of color on the cover, but like their face is partially in shadow or they're facing away from the camera. You only see the side of their face, like their face is obscured in some way. And like you can basically only see her eye. I mean, you can see her brown skin on her hand. Is that enough? I don't know. Can't please people that care about this shit. Here's the description on Goodreads. Rebellions are built on hope. Set in a horrifying near future United States, 17 year old Layla Amin and her parents are forced into an internment camp for Muslim American citizens. With the help of newly made friends also trapped within the internment camp, her boyfriend on the outside, and an unexpected alliance, Layla begins a journey to fight for freedom, leading a revolution against the internment camp's director and his guards. Heart racing and emotional, internment challenges readers to fight complicit silence that exists in our society today. This is the shit that I can't fucking stand, okay? The only purpose of the story is to tell a good story and to make people feel something when they read it, perhaps. It's possible that the book evokes a certain feeling in people and that the author's intention was to evoke certain emotions or that was their hope that their good story would evoke certain emotions in people and then potentially it changes society in some way gets people to look at something in a way that they weren't thinking about it before but the fact that they're stating explicitly take this action this is what the book is doing it's challenging people to fight complicit silence that exists in our society today it's a piece of activism this book will make you realize that like we are on the road to internment camps for Muslim Americans unless we act now. Really? Really? No. I mean, anyone can write whatever they want, but in my opinion, if it's going to be a good story and you want to last the test of time, writing a book that's responding to a particular cultural moment, a particular fear in that cultural moment that doesn't tell a good story on its own, I don't understand the point of that. Crime fiction in particular generally responds to the fears of the cultural moment, but 
the books are still good mysteries and you can just read them as such. You don't have to know that this book about serial killers was written during a time where it's responding to a particular anxiety about serial killers for it to be an impactful read. Whereas you kind of have to know that this book is responding to a particular cultural moment to enjoy it, to be impacted by it. Because if you're reading this in like 70 years and you don't know the backstory behind when it was written, like if you just picked up this book and you're like, oh, what's this? And you read it, you'd be like, what the hell is this? Ugh. Lord. Next we have Mason Deaver's I Wish You All the Best about a non-binary teen who was kicked out by their parents after coming out but learns that sometimes from disaster one can build a happier new life. Mm hmm. See, the description is very bare bones because the important thing to note for this sale is that it's about a non-binary teen. That's all you really need to know. Selling point. Add to my to read list. Like, this book right here, got a non-binary teen, gotta read about all the non-binary teens, all the LGBT stuff. I used to be like this, please don't hate me. So let's look at the Goodreads description. When Ben DeBacker comes out to their parents as non-binary, there, because the non-binary took me a second. I was like, that's a grammatical mistake. And then I was like, nope, this is where we're at now. They're thrown out of their house and forced to move in with their estranged older sister, Hannah, and her husband, Thomas, whom Ben has never even met. Struggling with an anxiety disorder compounded by their parents' rejection, they come out only to Hannah, Thomas, and their therapist and try to keep a low profile in a new school. But Ben's attempts to survive the last half of senior year unnoticed are thwarted when Nathan Allen, a funny and charismatic student, decides to take Ben under his wing. As Ben and Nathan's friendship grows, their feelings for each other begin to change. And what started as a disastrous turn of events looks like it might just be a chance to start a happier new life. At turns heartbreaking and joyous, I wish you all the best is both a celebration of life, friendship, and love, and a shiny example of hope in the face of adversity. God, that was so confusing to read with the pronouns. Lord, I feel like the, reading that book would be just such a struggle for me just on a practical grammatical level. I mean, the rest of the description, like other than the fact that they're non-binary and that piece about them like coming out and being thrown out of the house. I mean, there are already a ton of stories like that about being gay. And now we've had stories about trans kids going through the same thing. And now we're having the stories about the non-binary kids, but it's not like a new story. It's about being rejected for an identity category that you can potentially keep hidden and choosing to reveal that identity category and suffering consequences. But then it's tempered here by the hope you know, meeting someone who accepts them and falling in love. I always like a classic friends to lovers type romance that has some extra meat to it, but just because it has a non-binary teen in it doesn't mean it's going to be a good book. And of course, because there's so few stories about non-binary people, people like want it to be really good and they don't want anyone to like criticize it because it's really important for this book to exist, you know? No, I want mediocre books to stop existing. So if this book is mediocre or shit, I'm going to say that it's mediocre or shit. I don't care what identity category is in there. I'm assuming the non-binary teen is supposed to be this one here on the left. Maybe that's just my bias talking. Maybe it's the one on the right. How the hell do I know what non-binary teens look like? I don't. I don't know what non-binary people look like. And let me tell you, there were a lot of them on OkCupid when I used to be on there and couldn't tell you what makes someone non-binary because they just look like men and women to me. And of course, let's note that one of these characters is not white. Gotta have POC on the cover now. And that one will be out on May 14th, 2019. If you would like to check it out, who wouldn't? Non-binary teen. So I'm gonna totally screw up the pronunciation on this name. But next we have Count Me In by Varsha Bajaj, the description from Publishers Marketplace. A 12 year old girl and the white boy next door become reluctant activists after witnessing a racially charged attack on her traditionally dressed Indian grandfather. And the photos she posts for friends and family go viral. Yep, this doesn't sound like activism at all. Just sounds like a normal story. Of course, nothing to see here. Let's just slide over to Goodreads. An uplifting story told through the alternating voices of two middle schoolers in which community rallies to reject racism. Sounds so interesting and I'm sure it's very nuanced. Karina Chopra would have never imagined becoming friends with the boy next door. After all, they've avoided each other for years and she assumes Chris is just like the boys he hangs out with, who she labels a pack of hyenas. Then Karina's grandfather starts tutoring Chris and she discovers he's actually a nice, funny kid. Oh, you mean we shouldn't just judge people based on 
practically nothing. Maybe you should get to know someone before you judge them. But one afternoon, something unimaginable happens. The three of them are assaulted by a stranger who targets Indian American Karina and her grandfather because of how they look. Her grandfather is gravely injured and Karina and Chris vow not to let hate win. When Karina posts a few photos related to the attack on social media, they quickly attract attention. And before long, her hashtag count me in post, what does an American look like? Hashtag immigrants, hashtag we belong, hashtag I'm American, hashtag hate has no home here, goes viral and a diverse population begin to add their own photos. Then when Papa is finally on the road to recovery, Karina uses her newfound social media reach to help celebrate both his homecoming and a community coming together. So we literally have a story about shit going viral and hashtags. Like, this is where we're at. This is being published August 27th, 2019. The book was probably sold in 2017, which generally means, like, unless the author is really quick, I mean, they probably spent, like, a couple of years working on it. And I don't know if this is, like, based on something in particular, but, like, Indian American seems like a particularly weird character category for like racially motivated attacks. Maybe someone can link me to a bunch of posts about Indian people getting attacked for being Indian. Anywho, again, we have a piece of activism. It's like, it's bad to attack people for what they look like. And here's how you can use social media to bring attention to these issues. Hashtag activism. It's just like, always seems like it's trying to convince someone of something and this isn't the audience. YA is read almost exclusively by women, mostly adults. And then there are like some actual teenagers that read YA and they're still mostly women. None of them think like, oh, you know, it's a great thing for people to do attack people because of the way that they look. Maybe it's supposed to be so you can like, relate to the experience somehow. Like, this happened to me. Someone in my neighborhood was attacked for how they look and now there's a book about it that I can relate to. I really don't know. I am very confused by this book, but I completely understand why it was sold because it's got diverse characters. It's a piece of activism that satisfies all the leftist ideologues that run young adult publishing imprints. This one had a different title when it was sold, so let me read you that description. Tanya Guerrero's debut, The Wild Side, inspired by the author's multicultural background, Filipino and Spanish. That is literally the whole description that went into Publishers Marketplace. That's all you need to know. It's based on her multicultural background, so it's a hashtag own voices novel. So she has the cred to write about being Filipino and Spanish and Filipino and Spanish characters because, you know, this is what I hate. Like, I don't want author self-insert. I don't want you to basically write a memoir that's disguised as a novel. Like, if you do that and you pull it off successfully and you create a good novel, then I don't give a fuck. But my selling point isn't like, oh, you basically wrote your own, like, life experiences into a novel. That's all I need to know. You know, because they happen to be Filipino and Spanish. You know, no one gives a fuck if it's, like, a white person who happened to write their life experiences into the novel. But, you know, this identity category is super important. We don't have enough Filipino and Spanish in the books, so it doesn't matter if the book is good, just she wrote her experiences in there, so it'll be great. Moving over to the Goodreads description, it is now called How to Make Friends with the Sea, which, you know, is probably good because The Wild Side is kind of a generic-ass title. Pablo is homesick. He's only 12 years old, but he's lived in more countries than he can count. After his parents divorced, he and his mother have moved from place to place for years, never settling anywhere long enough to call it home. And along the way, Pablo has collected more and more fears of dirt, of germs, and most of all, of the ocean. Now they're living in the Philippines, and his mother, a zoologist who works at a local wildlife refuge is too busy saving animals to notice that Pablo might need saving too. Then his mother takes in Chiki, an orphaned girl with a cleft lip, and Pablo finds that through being strong for Chiki, his own fears don't seem so scary. You might even find the courage to face his biggest fear of all and learn how to make friends with the sea. And I'm like, okay, like that sounds fine. It sounds like a middle grade novel that I'm sure is touching and heartwarming and all that shit. But like, why do I give a fuck if she's Filipino and Spanish having written this book? And like, where even does the Filipino and the Spanish Spanish part come into it. Like, where does the being Spanish, like, where is that important? It just seems like it's about a kid who is living with a divorced mom, who is experiencing the displacement and moving around and finding stability through having responsibility for someone else. But as you can see, none of that needed to make it into the announcement of the sale, even though when they announced it, they would have known what the plot was. But identity categories are what matter. That is a lesson that we can take from the young adult fiction. All right, the last one, there is no good research 
description yet, so I'm just going to read the description from the sale. Shiva Karim's Bismillah Beat, but a group of Muslim American teens competing to be the face of an iconic Southern cookie company and finding themselves forging friendships and navigating complicated conflicts between teammates and, after gaining media attention upon becoming finalists, defending the team against both Islamophobic attacks and objections from within the Muslim community. Okay, that's a pretty weird sounding one, like very specific. And clearly it's like, oh, you know, iconic Southern cookie company, Southerners are racist and they don't like Muslims. So it's like a whole thing that the Muslims are going to become the face of the cookie company. And like, yes, there are books that rely on particular cultural moments. But again, you have to make a good story and just knowing young adult writers, knowing that world, I just really doubt that this probably turns out to be a good book. It's possible, but it just seems unlikely. It, like, it's not a story where the teens have to be Muslims and the story is about teenagers that are trying to become the face of a cookie company. It's about the Islamophobia and the backlash from their community, like the race piece of it. And I'm not saying that that can't be an interesting story or whatever, but I don't know. It just like fits the narrative. Like people hate Muslims. You gotta write books about it. And I'm not saying that there aren't people that hate Muslims. I know that there are, but again, of who's gonna read this book are gonna read this book and be like, yeah, Islamophobia is bad. I didn't know that before. And nobody who hates Muslims is gonna read this fucking book and be like, my mind was changed by the way these Muslim teens became the face of this Southern cookie company and defeated Islamophobia. I was so wrong. No. It's not gonna happen. That was my first rant in this series. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos on publishing, I have a playlist for that. If you have any comments, leave them down below. If you enjoy this video, please like it and consider subscribing. And I hope to have more content for you very soon.